Good morning, and let me share with you something interesting. Joshua 1.6, be strong and of good courage. Then you look at Joshua 1.7, only be thou strong and very courageous. Then you go to Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. And then in Joshua 18, only be strong and of good courage. Here within a matter of 12 verses, we find the expression, be strong and of good courage, four times. You know, in Semitic languages, when something's repeated, it's for a sense of emphasis. And it seems very obvious that uh, God has a very powerful message here when he tells us to be strong and of good courage. Well, is strength and courage something that is a choice? Um, does a person have a choice of being strong? And is courage a choice? Well, we need to look at these words in its original language. Um, now, in the context, Joshua is now uh, declared the leader after Moses died, and God is commanding him and then the people of Israel to be strong and of good courage um, as they enter into this land, because that is where the problem was at 40 years earlier. They chickened out. They had their chance to enter the promised land, but... Uh, they saw giants out there, and they saw that, well, they had been living a pretty good, you know, relatively a good life, and they're wandering in the wilderness. I mean, every morning there was manna from heaven. All they had to do was collect it. They didn't have to cultivate the land and take care of it and grow it and harvest it. Food was there every day for them. You needed water? Man, Moses just hit a rock and the water came. And now all of a sudden they go into this promised land and the Bible says that the spies reported the land consumes them. And what he meant by saying the land consumes them is that they spent all their time just farming, all their time trying to gather their food. At least, you know, in the wilderness, we had all this free time, you know, to learn about God and study the Torah and laws of God. And now we're going to have to enter a place where we, we, we got to work. Well, on top of that, they had to go in and conquer the land. And, you know, that's a little scary, too, going to battle, even though God promised them victory. And their first battle was against Jericho, where they didn't have one casualty. Uh, God took care of them still. Even though you know God's going to take care of you, you know it. You've lived your life, man, I'm 70 years old now, and all my life God has always been there for me. He's always um, you know, when I look over my life, you know, he, he's always, he's always been there, always protecting me, always, um, providing, you know, times I, 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 you know, there's times, even up till now, there's times, you know, uh, we face a financial situation and wonder where in the world is, you know, how can God resolve this thing? But Sure enough, you know, the finances are there somewhere, some out of the blue. I'm just absolutely amazed sometimes how it just comes through. Um, you know, and uh, even after all that, even after all that trusting in God, you know, something comes along and I'm still questioning, boy, is God going to come true, through or not this time? Maybe he's going to let me down this time. After 70 years, and I can't point to one place where he's let me down, I still question whether or not he's going to come through. And that's why he's saying, be strong of good courage. The word strong that's used here, you've got a couple words for strength, like Oz and so forth. Uh, but this word is kazak, which is a strange word to use for strong, because it really means a will. Uh, your will, your free will. Um but to be firm uh, in your will, a strong will. You know, you ever hear what a strong-willed child is? He was one that just won't, <laughs> you know, he keeps resisting and resisting. Well, that's what God is saying. Be strong-willed. Uh, keep resisting those forces that are coming against you. And I think in this country, we're going to see more and more forces coming against us uh, to compromise. You know, we, we want to be accepted by the world. We want Christianity to be, you know, like in the old days when everybody just honored, oh, yeah, you know, he's a Christian, he's a good man. Uh, 
you know, we we want those days back again where people kind of watch their language around us and they respected us for our faith. And that's not happening lately. And in fact, um, we're going to be forced to compromise just to get that acceptance. So tone down our message a little. Uh, don't go out evangelizing so much. That's upsetting people, offending people. Don't call them sinners. Don't talk about sin. That's offensive to people. And churches are coming under that. You know, many churches now, are pastors are preaching the feel-good message. They're not talking about the blood of Jesus. They're not talking about sin uh, and, you know, repentance and forgiveness of God and salvation. Evangelism uh, is taking a big hit. But on the other hand, there are many Christians out there who are Kazakh. They're firm. Uh, I, you know, I've seen on social media, of course, social media is the wild, wild west of our nation today, so you don't know what you can believe, but I, I think a lot of it's true is when it talks about Christians who are out there standing up for their faith, you know, the rioters and protesters out there, and then you've got groups of Christians out there praying over people and singing hymns, and, you know, they're coming under attack. It takes courage. Well, that's the next word that's here is have, it's not says just courage, but good courage. Well, the word good is not used here in the text. It's simply the word amas. And this is a courage which is a very firm resolve, but it's a good type of courage. I had a student one time, he was a member of Delta Force. That's sort of the elite, I guess the armed forces. He had been a Green Beret and then achieved so high in that that they moved him up to a Delta Force. Um, their job was solely to uh, free hostages and free American hostages. Uh, and, you know, he faced, you know, a lot, a lot of the things he did weren't even recognized by the media. It was kept secret. You know, he would go out on mission after mission that would be unknown to the public, risking his life to save American hostages. Um, and I asked him, and he, you know, that must take a lot of courage. Uh, you're probably really fearless. And he says, you know, I'm scared like everybody else. And I face those situations, it does scare me. But you know what true courage is? It's when you're so afraid, and yet you move forward anyways. And I immediately thought, that is the definition of a mass. It's to be afraid, but to move forward anyways. And this is what God's commanding us to do. Um, you know, especially coming in the future where our faith is, may come under a very strong testing. It's going to be very easy to compromise. It's, it's going to be very easy, you know, we're not going to lose our freedom of religion in this country. It's so entrenched in our psyche in this nation. Um, you know, they're not going to pass laws against religion. They're not going to turn this into like the old Soviet Union or China where you're going to go to jail for your, just for believing in Jesus Christ. Nobody's going to do that to us. It'll take a few generations to even get to that point. Uh, you know, even your ranked liberals, or what they call the left-wingers, uh, will still uh, say, yeah, you still have to have freedom of religion. Uh, they'll still respect that. But what the enemy is going to do is very subtly take away the respect that people have for religion. You're going to get a lot of crazies out there who are going to be emboldened, especially now as we're going through this period of uh, lawlessness and, you know, many rioters are feeling emboldened. And I read where one, uh, one of the Christians who was out there among the rioters just sharing the love of Jesus Christ was shot for just carrying a Bible by some crazy. Um, you know, it's going to be a very subtle attack that the enemy is going to have against us. And it's going to be very subtle for us to compromise and well, you know, I just, you know, we don't want to offend people. I mean, that's the big thing now. Be very careful with the language you use. use only, don't use certain words. You don't want to be offensive. And people are losing their jobs for their offensiveness. 
you know, we've got a Supreme Court justice who's going, who's a very devout Catholic. And already, you know, the news media is talking about she's going to be questioned about her faith, even though it's very illegal to question a person's faith when they apply for a job. They're going to do it anyways. And they're going to make it seem like because of their devout faith, they're not going to vote. You know, they're going to use their faith in their uh, voting or, you know, in their judgment on the Supreme Court. Um, you know, and very subtly, it's going to force us to compromise. And we're going to be called to be strong and of good courage. In other words, we're going to be strong to stand firm in our faith to know exactly what we believe. I think times come where Christians are going to be forced to really know what they believe. You know, I'm writing now on my um, uh, subscription site. I've got what's called an in-depth study, and uh, and I'm doing a series. Actually, it's going to be like a book, but I'm never going to get the book published, sort of on the fringe. And I talk about crazy stuff. You know, like the Garden of Eden and the trees. The word trees in Hebrew means a concentration of energy, a penetration. And so I speculate that really the trees were portals or wormholes into another uh, part of the universe. And that children were born in the Garden of Eden would pass through this portal into the universe and then populate the planets. And now they're coming back to visit. You know, crazy stuff like that. Ask me, do I believe it? I don't. I don't know if I do or not. You know, that's why I'm never going to publish the book for crying out loud, because, hey, I don't know if I really believe that stuff. Could be. I don't know. I mean, I'm, but I'm using scripture to back it all up and using the Hebrew language to show how it's possible. Um, but it's just fun. I play around with it. Uh, but do I believe it or not? I, I don't know. And if somebody held a gun to my head and, and said, so, you believe that crap? And I say, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I don't for a moment. I'm just having fun. Just writing my science fiction. Um, but when it comes to certain things, like Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that all, everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God, that we must accept Jesus as our Savior, and that he's coming back. Um, these things, that he is, was born, born of a virgin, uh, and he walked this earth, and he died on a cross, and he rose again. That, that I'm firm in. And that is where I take my kazakh. That is where I take my stand. I can't back down from that. I can't bend, as Tavia said, fit on the roof. I can only bend so far before I break. And I can bend a lot, but there comes a point I can't bend any further. You, I can't reach that point of denying that Jesus is Lord, denying the Word of God as the inspired Word of God, the Bible. That, I have to be Kazakh. And with that, it's going to take good courage, a mass. In other words, no matter how fearful it is to stand up for my faith, I have to move forward in that. Or I could never look God in the face again if I didn't. Uh, could never accept his presence in my life if I was to deny that. Um, and, uh, you know, in our class yesterday, we were talking about a word, um, rooster, which is the same, gavar, which is the same word for man, and I asked the class to uh, come up with some par comparisons between, you know, especially like when Peter, the cock crowed twice, the rooster crowed twice, and he denied him three times. And someone said, well, yeah, that was a symbol that when Peter denied Jesus, he moved in the flesh, the gavar, the man, like, and gavar is the same word for rooster. So the rooster calling was exactly that. It was uh, Peter moving in the flesh rather than showing that courage, that amas of standing up for what he believed. Instead, the rooster crowed, remind him, you're Gavar. You just moved in the flesh. 
So what's going to keep us from moving in the flesh? You know, there's a story. It's uh, in the book of Judges about a man named Gideon who basically was a coward. You know, he was yellow. And he would admit it too, you know? He says, you know, people say I'm a, I'm chicken, I'm yellow, I have a big streak down my back, I'm a mama's boy, you know what, they're right. And God called him a great and mighty warrior. <laughs> he said, come on, man, you picked the wrong person for that. But he was obedient. He got together an army and they were going to uh, go against the Midianites who were they, they were just running rampant. It was violence in the streets. It was rioting every day. The Midianites would come through to destroy their crops, killing the people in the villages and everybody would run and hide. And they had no defense, no army. And the Midianites just had their way, pillaging, raping, stealing. They could barely grow crops without it being stolen by the Midianites. And people cried out to God, you got to do something. So he raised this coward named Gideon and says, go get him. And Gideon got together. He sent out the call and he managed to get uh, around 22,000 men. Yeah, but that was hardly enough to go against 110,000. And, you know, that's basically what God said. And Gideon said, yeah, you're right. You know, there's not that many. God says, yeah, you got too many. You, you, I give you a victory of 22,000 men against 110,000. You're still going to say, wow, look what we did. Boy, we're pretty good. Tell everybody who's a chicken and a coward just to go home. But not you, Gideon. You hang around. <laughs> so he told all those who were fearful, afraid, get out of here. You know, if you're a bunch of mama boys, then just go home to mama. And, man, he was almost trampled in a stampede. Over 12,000 took off running for home, and he was left with 10,000. God didn't want the cowards going to battle. You know, you tell any commander they don't want a coward in their outfit. The coward is one who he's afraid and he succumbs to that fear and he doesn't move forward. He wants those of courage who are afraid but will move forward like Gideon did. In spite of his fears, he moved forward. So it whittled down to 300 men. 300 brave warriors. Um, you know, it took them for a test. Everybody drinks some water from the pond. And those who got down and lapped up the water like a dog get a lot more water that way. They, God didn't want them. They weren't focused. You know, the ones who were really focused was the one who scooped water up their hands and licked it out of their hands. While the other hand was free and they were watching. They were the warriors. They were the ones who were always ready for battle. Uh, you know, they were the ones, they were fearful. And it was out of that fear that made them very cautious. And that's why they always had one hand on a sword and the other hand drinking the water, slipping out of their hand. They weren't getting as much water as the other, lapping up like a dog. But boy, they were ready. You know, they were fearful just like the others were fearful. But they were prepared in their fear. They let their fear not only they didn't ignore their fear, they were ready to confront their fears. That is what a must is, ready to confront your fears. And then the battle, you know, they went to go to battle. Well, what happened here? Uh, Gideon, God, you know, here he is, 300 men, the Midianites down there in their camp. It was nighttime. They were all asleep, 110,000 of them. And Gideon's army was circled around uh, a mountain, looking down in the valley where the Midianites was, 110,000 strong. And old Gideon, man, he's pacing. He is scared to death. And God said, Gideon, what? <laughs> don't do that, Lord. <laughs> don't sneak up on me like that. God said, uh, Gideon, you still scared? Who, me? Uh, <laughs> Gideon, if you're still afraid, if you're still chicken, if you're still yellow, I want you to do something. And when God said that, Gideon said, I'll do it. And God said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I will give you the confidence to go into battle here. Um, but 
you got to do one thing first to get that confidence. Go into the Midianite camp. God sent him down into the area that he was terrified, where he feared the most. And God sent him down there. Uh, and he went. In spite of his fears, he went. And as he was crawling through the camp, why is God making me do this stupid thing? They're going to lock me over the head. Old Gideon's is going to be gone. He's going to be dead. It's going to be awful. And then he heard something. Some old boy in a tent had a dream, and he woke up screaming, Ah, horrible, terrible. There. His tent mate woke up, what, what's going on? What, what happened? He said, Oh, I just had this most horrible dream, but I don't know what it means. You know, this little barley cake, it was like a you know, little pancake, came rolling down the hill into our camp and blew everything apart. And his tent mate said, Oh, man, you know what that means? That means Gideon's going to defeat us. And when Gideon heard that, then he knew God was with him. You see, you're not going to get the confidence that God's with you until you confront your fears. Scared to death to move forward for his name's sake. You know, there were many anti-protesters out there who, they did go out and they sing praises to God, praying uh, over these rioters. That took a lot of guts. You can't tell me those, those people didn't have fears, but they went forward in their fears. And when they did, God blessed that and gave them the confidence to stand up for him. And, you know, they did. Many found Jesus, many of these rioters and protesters. They battled it with the love of God. You know, Gideon stood there in the Midianite camp and had a rather, rather Pentecostal meltdown. Quietly, of course. Went back, got them in together, and led them in the charge. You see, God's always with you 24-7. The fact is, you've got to know it. You know it, but you don't really know it. You know, it's like... Uh, I remember a friend of my father's who was, uh, well, he was actually the director of Bible Rescue Mission, and it's, he himself was a drunk out there on Skid Row and got saved. He said, but I went to the mission and I heard the gospel. I went to the mission and I heard the gospel. One day I went to the mission and I heard the gospel. Uh, you know, you know God's with you, you know God's with you, but until you walk into those centers of your fear and good courage, not foolish courage, not going against, you know, it's not like driving recklessly 90 miles an hour down a side street. Ooh, look how brave I am. That's foolish courage. Good courage is when you know you have to act. You know you have to do something to protect someone, to, to protect the name of God, to carry the name of God. And you're scared to do it, but you do it anyways. That is a must. It's good courage. And God is with you every moment of the day. And until you know it, I mean, you know it, but you got to really know it. Because when you really know it, that's when you get the good courage. And when you really know it, you're going to really, everything you do, you're going to do is unto him. And it'll get easier and easier. Uh, you'll still enter, you know, I'm seven years old when I still go into battle for the Lord. It's still scary, but boy, I know right at the end of that battle or during that battle, I'm going to experience God, and I'm going to find and discover that He is faithful. And, you know, a thousand, two thousand years from now, I'm going to be giving that testimony to the angels who never have an opportunity. Angels don't have fear like we do and need to overcome it. And they're going to love hearing that testimony. Uh, so every time you do something for God, you're just packing away future testimonies that you're going to give for eternity throughout all the universe where God has established his creation. You'll just spend eternity traveling, talking about the great things that God did when you were here on earth. So 
Take every opportunity you can. Every day you live is an opportunity to get a new testimony. And God is ready to give it to you. Just remember, he's always with you. And whatever you do, do as unto him.